This is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus. I wanted to remind you that the show is not intended to be a recommendation for diagnosis or treatment of any condition for any specific person. Please consult your mental health professional or doctor managing your ADHD or mental health issues about any diagnosis or treatment related information that you hear on the show. Refer your ADHD provider to the show if he or she would like more information. Today we'll be talking with Aaron Croft and his experience of struggles before ADHD diagnosis and the difference having the diagnosis and treatment has made in his life since that time. He says he appeared to have it all going when he got into Harvard University, but that was the beginning of his demise. He then struggled nonstop for 15 years until he was broke, divorced, earning minimum wage, and failing out of his first seven jobs. And he went on to get a master's degree in coaching psychology and then a diagnosis of inattentive ADHD and life turned around. He built a successful career consulting to companies like Marriott, Johnson Johnson, McDonald's, United Healthcare as a change management consultant. He also got remarried. Most importantly, discovered how to get stuff done with a neurodivergent brain. Now he's on the mission to raise awareness about inattentive ADHD how it goes under the radar, how to rebuild your life post-diagnosis. His website is hiddenadhd.com. Aaron, it's a privilege to have you on the show today. It's a privilege to be on the show with you, Doc. So, what are some details on life uh, before ADHD, both you know, growing up when you didn't have to worry about running a business and all those things, and then what uh, what happened after you got to Harvard? <laughs> uh, yeah, those are uh, those are some some painful and embarrassing memories to relive. But you know, growing up, I was I was a naturally good test taker, and you know, so some of the stuff at school came kind of easily to me. Uh, and you know, what that masked was the fact that. Everything was done at the last minute. Uh, I never read a book cover to cover in middle school and high school. And, you know, the toll that it took on me to only be able to do work when it was the last minute and panic set in was, uh, while it was effective at getting me good grades, it was emotionally, physically, and mentally just draining yeah, I see so many people in middle school, high school particularly, that most of what they do is homework. And admittedly, they may start homework at 9 o'clock at night, but they're staying up till 1 o'clock. Why it's girls who tend to have the determination to finish that homework, they're up to 1 o'clock. Boys seem to give up about 7.30. Um, but then... Girls aren't getting any sleep. Things get worse. They can't think as well. And uh, everything is last minute, barely keeping ahead of the uh, the train that's coming down behind you. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that very much mirrors my experience. And it wasn't a particularly fun time. And, you know, the, the real challenge, I think, especially with inattentive ADHDers, right? I mean, if you're hyperactive, impulsive, like, you're a behavior problem, you're pissing off teachers, you're bouncing off the walls, you're annoying your parents, like, like fine, you're, you know, you, you might mm -hmm. get, like, dealt with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, when you have the inattentive presentation, like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to neurotypicals. And frankly, I have a ton of empathy for neurotypicals because I understand why it doesn't make sense. Like, but, you know, to my mom and to other people, it was just like, Aaron's lazy, and thinks that he doesn't have to do the work. And, you know, I'm like, I still work on in therapy kind of, you know, to this day, like working on rewriting some of those narratives that, you know, got ingrained at a time when my brain was really impressionable. Uh, but it turns out in, in, you know, after the fact that 
that that wasn't the case. And I even knew it at the time. I was like, I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like, I, I, it's not like I want to procrastinate on the work. I just can't get myself to do it. Yes. And when neurotypical parents or even a parent who has ADHD but doesn't know it, keep on badgering you or me or any child with ADHD, how come you can't do it? You can do better than that. How many times do I have to tell you that uh, you get beaten down and figure, well, something's wrong with me as a person rather than my behaviors aren't measuring up? Um, and yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there, Doc. Like, that's that's actually one of the primary things that, you know, I found for me was the big shift, and it's a shift that... I really focus on with a lot of my coaching and training clients, which is this amazing shift from there's something wrong with me to there's just something wrong with my strategy. And, Mm -hmm. you know, all the strategies that we've been given, all the strategies on productivity or on any of these things, you know, planning in the personal development literature aren't really made for ADHD years. They're way too complex. They're not sustainable. And, you know, then be like, oh, things wrong with me. And and when they can just adopt a different strategy that's more tailor made for their particular brains, and they're like, oh, huh, I can do this yeah. stuff. I just need a different, you know, set of uh, variables to unlock the combination. They're like, oh, okay, maybe something's not wrong with me. This is good. So um, then you got to Harvard, and you you're good at taking tests. You got through high school. What happened? So you heard me mention kind of the physical and mental and emotional exhaustion. Um, I, I started, I looked at, I looked at the next four years at Harvard and I saw four more years of that. And then all the people at Harvard were talking about going into, you know, McKinsey or investment banking and I, you know, heard about those and it was 80 hour weeks and I was like, wait a minute, I'm about to sign myself up for a life of misery. Like, I mean, yeah, I produced results in high school, but at what cost? I mean, I was really unhappy. And so, and so I said, okay, great. I'm done. I'm done with this, uh, with what I call the panic strategy, which is yeah. if if there's a panic because there's a deadline coming up, uh, and the other strategy is is really that if the other people decide my my outcomes, right? Because there always is another person involved in the panic strategy, like the teacher and or the parent or the you know relationship partner. And I said, you know what? I'm just I'm done with this. And so I did what. Uh, most people do, especially at, you know, that kind of age. And I said, I just swung to the 180 degree opposite, uh, which was, I don't give a crap. I'm not going to make myself miserable. Um, and that was when I really got myself into trouble doc, because, um, it turns out that not making myself miserable in terms of doing work, uh, was effective in the short term. But yeah. it still made me miserable overall because I was still stressed about it. I was still I was still doing the shelf self self I can't talk self shaming cycle of procrastination, and you know so so now I'm really in a bind, right? I tried the panic and other people strategy in high school, middle school, and it was effective but miserable. Then I tried the I'm not going to put myself through that. And make myself miserable, so therefore I'll be happy. But that also made me miserable. And so I was really uh, at a really kind of terrible crossroads where neither approach was working. And then, so you dropped out of Harvard and looked at (laughs) working or starting businesses or were encouraged to drop out, whichever. Uh, So I dropped out uh, twice first time to run away uh, and try to retire to an island off the coast of New Zealand, but that's a little bit of a a lengthy tangent. Um, And then, and then the, or sorry, actually, no, that was the second time. The first time was just because 
yeah, it turns out if you do that and then you're about to fail out of classes, I realized I could withdraw rather than fail the classes. So that was the first time. And, uh, and so I, I took a year off, but it was a mandatory year off. And then the second time was more of a voluntary year off. But nonetheless, uh, in total, I took two years off and I ended up graduating in the course of three years because I had so many AP credits from high school. Mm -hmm. So effectively, Mm -hmm. I was on like, you know, if you take two years off, you're on like the six year plan to graduate. I mean, that's, that's pretty terrible. And, um, and yeah, so it was, you know, I stuck, I stuck pretty stubbornly with the, I'm not going to make myself miserable strategy. Uh, so that was, so I bare, I mean, I barely graduated, but part of it was just that, uh, my family was very much pushing me to graduate, understandably. Mm -hmm. And Harvard was very much pushing me to graduate because one of the variables that, uh, top universities get ranked on in the U S news and world report ranking, which is so important to them is the percentage of people who actually graduate that start. And so I, you know, I, I, I had a lot of people kind of, kind of holding my hand to make sure that I, uh, finished on my commitment. Mm -hmm. So then what was it that led to you getting, uh, thinking I've got to figure out if this is ADD or I just have to figure out what's going on. What, what triggered that? (laughs) Oh goodness. Yeah. Um, not, it's not a very pleasant story, but, uh, so I I pretty much, I, I stuck, I told you I stuck stubbornly and, you know, stubbornness Mm -hmm. is definitely one of my traits. I stuck pretty stubbornly. I mean, I'm talking like for 10 to 14 years on the, I'm not going to make myself miserable by doing work. I don't want to do approach. And so that led to failing out of my first seven jobs and businesses. Um, and then, you know, possibly not surprisingly to some of your listeners, it, it led to the dissolution of my first marriage. <laughs> um, and so, and so pretty much here I am. So I'm, I'm 32 years old and now I'm broke divorced and earning minimum wage. Uh, Mm. and I, uh, you know, I, I, I share the story just because I think it's important for people to understand. So, you know, I've moved, I've moved out and I'm moving into a shared house with four acquaintances and, uh, you know, I'm upstairs and I'm unpacking my post-divorce suitcase, uh, in the closet and then and then Billy uh comes and flops down on my king size bed. And Billy is this really, you know, sweet, very skinny, wiry, twenty six year old tech support analyst, originally from Vietnam, super nice guy. Um and, you know, he doesn't seem at all kinda awkward about flopping down on my bed. And at that point, it hit me that he hadn't flopped down on my king size bed. He'd actually flopped down on his half of our king size bed because that was all that I could afford at that mm-hmm. point of my life. Um, and yeah. And so that's when, hey, this this is really wrong. Not just something's not right, but this doesn't fit the picture of who I know myself to be and what the world sees. Yeah, I mean, I would love, I would love that to have been the story, um, but uh, it's uh, so so. That was like that was right around the time my thirty third birthday. So effectively, I'm thirty three and I'm I'm sharing a bed with another dude because uh, that's all I can afford, despite Harvard degree, all this stuff, and you know, earning next to nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we know, with me and with other ADHD brains, panic mode will get us to do stuff, and so that kind of yep. uh, triggered panic mode for me. And then I, you know, within a few months, I found a higher paying job. And, uh, and then from there I was able to switch to, a uh, to a even better job, you know, seven months later. And then, but then that was when, that was when the, you know, turd, uh, really hit the fan. 
Although mm-hmm. there's been there's been there's been a lot of those, so I got some messy fans in my life. But that was when the turd really hit the fan because, you know, I was three months in and I kinda had its false confidence, right? Which was I finally I finally figured life out. But I hadn't really addressed the core of what was causing all these problems. And so I'm three months in, I think everything's great, and my boss sits me down and just says, Um, Aaron, so we talked to the client, the consulting client, and um, your work is like not even remotely up to par. Uh, mm-hmm. So look, you know, you're not getting fired just yet, but you're still under probation. And you know, all you got to do to make this right is you just need to stay late, you know, after work for the next couple weeks redo the stuff that you've done to date, but you can't do it during business hours because, you know, you need to be doing new work. Yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, you're laughing because you you are, I mean, like my, I was, I, I mean, (laughs) there was no way in, you know, the heaven that that was achievable for me. I was already impressed that I was showing up, you know, every day for a job, uh, let alone staying awake to do, you know, staying late to do like a, a second job redo. And, um, and so, and so I kind of saw my entire life rebuild, you know, post divorce, I'm trying to date, um, you know, and, and being unemployed. I didn't know if I could really talk myself into any, you know, I didn't, I mean, I already had a resume that was like Swiss cheese. I didn't think I could sell myself into any more jobs if this one fell through. And, uh, so I, in a panic called a friend who had mentioned socially, and this is a terrible story and no one should try this at home, but I'm just telling it out of transparency and vulnerability. I had called a friend who had mentioned, um, his ADHD and that he takes Adderall. He had mentioned out drinking because one night we were out drinking. Uh, I mentioned I was single, you know, we're at bars. And he was like, oh, yeah, I had an Adderall earlier, so I'm going to be up late and, like, partying. Uh, and I called him up, and I was like, hey, dude, I know you've mentioned Adderall. I've never had it before in my life, but I'm about to get fired if I can't stay late and get this work done. Um, and I know you said it helps you stay awake. Uh, so, like, I know you're not supposed to, but, like, can I, can I borrow some? <laughs> You know, I, that is such a common experience um, in terms of a friend said, why don't you try it? Or I asked about trying it. One doctor here in, in this area, um, he was a pediatrician and specialized in ADHD, said uh, on the second or third visit, he asked the parent, so how was it when you took one? <laughs> because he figured they probably did either when they saw the biggest the change in their child or my kid's not going to take one and I don't know what it'll do. And the answer was, man, I got a lot done that day. <laughs> <laughs> because about half the time, one parent has it. So, yeah, it's not an un- uncommon story, though at least someone didn't sell it to you or you buy it from them because that's a felony and that's not a good idea. I'm probably giving it to someone. Who yeah. That just yeah. And, and no, I'm with you on that. And like, so I was super naive. I mean, I know that like some kids try this in like a study thing in college, but again, right in college, I wasn't trying to like, do work. Um, so, so it never crossed my path. And I literally just thought I was basically getting like advanced caffeine pills. Um, and you know, and then, and then so kind of like, you know, around lunchtime or like early afternoon, cause I, you know, thought it was going to give me that kind of boost. I, uh, I took it and then like I walked around for half an hour and then I came back and I sat down, didn't think anything of it. And, uh, I was working on like some boring slides or spreadsheets or whatever for the client. And, uh, and then like all of a sudden, like I look up and it's been like 15 minutes and I've like, I've never spent 15 minutes looking at something that boring and staying engaged. And then after I looked up, I went back and I was working on it for like another 15 minutes and I was like, Oh my God, I can focus on something at will. 
holy yeah. crap, is this what people have been saying my whole life when they're like, Aaron, just sit down and work on your thing. It was like, it was like a blind person developing, like, like finally seeing purple for the first time and being like, oh, this is what people were describing. <laughs> and to me, it was like, you mean other people do this all the time? I know, wow. right? Like, who? Like, I didn't even know that this is a thing. I thought everyone's yeah. just more, like, disciplined and motivated than mm-hmm. I am. Yeah, so then you thought, maybe I ought to go get this legit. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was night and day. Like, it was like a blind person putting on glasses for me. It was like, holy crap. I mean, mm-hmm. it wasn't like I could stay awake. It was like I could get things done for the first time in my life. And so, yeah, so I immediately like booked an appointment with a psychiatrist and, uh, you know, explained my background and, you know, he was like, man, you meet the diagnostic criteria, but like, let me just ask you this. How have you managed to get to this point in your life? (laughs) Like, you know, relatively okay. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, I had somewhat, I guess, a little bit of the reverse experience. I was diagnosed after I was in practice, um, had been for a number of years, and was trying to kind of administer an office and have to keep track of personnel and putting out fires, etc., and practice medicine. Um, Mm -hmm. And someone I was talking with said, you know, you may want to check out whether you have ADD or talk, go find someone to help you with your ADD. Oh, okay. So a psychiatrist, we talked for an hour and a half and she said, yeah, you have ADD. And I said, okay, wait a minute. How does someone with ADHD get through medical school? She <laughs> said, that was your hyper focus. And that was it. I love the study of medicine. I love practicing medicine. I'd been about a B student through high school. I had honors all the way through med school because I just ate it up. And, you know, I think I think what you're talking about there is... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't have to write papers. I could just do the work. It was right in front of me. And I think what you're talking about there is so important. And I remember that... Uh, this came up on the panel uh, that we were on together about, you know, ADHD behind the scenes, what it looks like, what it really looks like to be a successful adhd And I think all of us panelists universally agreed that really if you can make kind of that, that hyper-focus and that, that, you know, what sometimes people call passion or basically just that thing that you're intrinsically interested in, and motivated by, if you can find a way to tie that in to what becomes your profession, you are really well set up. Uh, agreed? Yes. Um, I tell kids in high school, you find something you really like to do, convince someone to pay you for it, you're set. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, a, it's such a secret of ADHD success because, I mean, you know, you've got, you've got that, uh, hyper focus and love on medicine. Like I'm the same way on psychology, productivity, neuroscience. So Mm. like there's a lot of things that I do that might appear to be work for other people, you know, to other people, like reading books on this stuff constantly and listening to audio books on it and Mm. signing up for Mm. courses and coaching programs as a client just to see, to learn more and to do more. And but like it, it isn't work to me. It's enjoyable. It's fun. I do that crap on the weekends. I do that crap on vacation because it's a joy. I love mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just get into it, and it's fun to think about and work at. And then the other thing I think is is uh, maybe a, a second secret power is our associational mind. Someone says something, you read someone something and that triggers a thought from it could be three years before oh yeah those two things kind of fit together oh but then that would do this and you're off on this string of things that it's impossible to explain to someone because it happens in about a minute and you put together six things 
Um, yeah. And sorry, you were you were finishing. Yeah. Yeah. Ideas come together. Well, and like in in you know that idea that you're talking about there, that's actually you know if I, if there's one thing that's at the core of my business and it being successful is is really that, which is that. Uh, I took a lot of the, you know, that associational thing or the fact that because I couldn't do the hard yards that other people could do, uh, mm-hmm. that I got really good at figuring out what is the minimum effective dose. What's the, what's the, what's the least I can do for the highest return. But that's become the crux of my business where I take, I take my love of productivity and, you know, psychology and neuroscience, I read all these different books, and they're all complex as all get out. I mean, no chance. I have so many, I have a graveyard of like half done productivity systems that I started and then gave up after a few weeks or months. And, but I then take that with my associative mind and with that, like how to do the least and get the most reward. And then I put together these like really streamlined productivity systems. uh, And people get these like huge results, but it's all kind of using some of the ADHD things that got me in trouble in the past. Now they're kind of a, a secret to being effective. Yeah. You can pull things out of different parts of what you read and see, Oh, these will kind of fit together into this. Um, and, and, uh, it's very difficult for someone with ADHD, trying to get through middle school, high school, when you're being told you're lazy, you're dumb, how come you can't do this, uh, and everything's in panic mode, to understand that it's possible to have that associational part, because there, there's no peace in your mind, you're getting all this negative input. Um, so I think that one can learn how to use that after diagnosis, though maybe we know, we learn we, we can use it, but we don't recognize it for what it is. Um, and because I think it is something that just, just happens. And I, I don't know, I'm sure that I can't explain, couldn't explain why it happened. Um, all along sure. the way, whether it's medicine or anything else I was doing. Um, but it's definitely a, a trait that's there with ADHD. So what, um, I'm assuming the first part of your treatment was, okay, I'll take medication because I know that can help me focus. <laughs> what did medication not address that you needed to come up with other ways, other strategies to use? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit kind of embarrassingly and a bit vulnerably, um, which is that I was, you know, so blown away by medication at the beginning. And, you know, I went from being this uh, underperformer to like an average performer and even actually to like at times an above average performer. And I was like, this is great. And then I was able to show up to my job every day and I passed like the one year anniversary at my job. And, you know, I mean, like that's something like my mom would like celebrate like it was, you know, I won the World Cup or something. I mean, it was like, holy crap, Aaron's been at the company longer than a year at a job. And um, I I kind of was like, this is amazing. And uh but I also didn't really like what I was doing, but I was just so happy that I could perform. And yeah. so I, um, I, I'm just kind of stuttering a little bit or stammering a little bit because it's a little bit embarrassing, but I kind of was like, okay, this is the peak of my potential. I can hold down a job. This mm-hmm. is amazing. I don't really like the job. And the rest of the time I basically just like got addicted to playing video games, smoking weed, eating Lucky Charms and candy and like Mm -hmm. watching, watching TV. And that was like a solid, I mean, I was like solidly a year or maybe longer after my diagnosis, like pretty right after. Yeah. It sounds like what? 
it sounds like what people have told me and kids that uh, yeah they stay home maybe they didn't they barely got out of high school can't get into college because they barely got out of high school and gee but I can live here in the basement in my parents house and I deliver pizzas and I can play video games and smoke weed and life is good um, there's just not any figuring out it could be a lot better if um, and even though yep they're taking vacation for their ADD great they can probably could focus on video games pretty well but now they can even better um, so what kicked <laughs> you out of that pattern yeah I mean what kicked me out of it uh, David was just that I I got to a point that I started I started to finally for the first time in my life think that maybe I could achieve more maybe just holding down a job wasn't holding down a job that I didn't like wasn't my highest level of achievement in the, in my life and it was at that point that I had to confront uh that the medication was only taking me so far. And it was at that point that I finally got, you know, kind of the, the aphorism or adage or whatever the term would be of like the pills don't teach skills. And I said, wow, okay, if I really want to step into my potential, like maybe I can, you know, be a manager. Maybe I could be a, you know, executive. Maybe I can, maybe I can do more. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. I needed to, I needed to have some skills outside of it. Uh, and so that was really, it was really just kind of that longing of like, oh, maybe holding down a job isn't just my highest calling. Yeah. Especially a boring job. Yeah. <laughs> so then you picked up those skills. Was it from reading or therapy or coaching? Um, yeah. Uh, so it was, it was from a combination. Uh, so I'd say it was really, really from three things. So one, definitely from reading. Two was I was able to, uh, so, so reading, reading and watching like YouTube videos. So like just understanding the ADHD brain, understanding the differences. And, you know, I think one of the things, one of the reasons I held off on doing it, because I want to say this just because I think some of your listeners could be in a similar place, is I didn't want to, I didn't want to create, you know, a placebo or a nocebo in terms of reading about the symptoms and then like suddenly having them. Uh, yeah. But I found that it was, it was actually the opposite. The more I learned about ADHD and the ADHD brain and the neurobiology of it, the more I was like, oh, that's why I do that thing. Yeah. And I could start to, I could start to use it um, intentionally. So, you know, I, I realize that that's abstract and I, I could give an example, but I think it's more important to, um, to say, so, I, so that was one is I just, you know, started reading and learning about the ADHD brain. Uh, two was coaching. Coaching was, mm -hmm phenomenal um, and helpful, but it was also expensive. And then three was I was able to, you know, take all the knowledge that I'd acquired over reading books about psychology and personal development and productivity and kind of combine that with my master's degree. And I realized that I actually knew a lot about how to be productive. I just hadn't really had the tools in the path to implement it. And so... The, those three things uh, really combined, and I was slowly, it was a trial and error process, but, you know, I was able to move on to a better job that I, I liked more, um, and I was good, but, and I was, you know, promotion and all that, but then at one point in there, after about a year, uh, I realized that my true passion Right. And it's kind of like these uncovered over time because I didn't think it was possible. So like my psyche just kind of put it away. But my true passion has always been personal development, helping other people, coaching, training, like, and I, I kind of connected with that. And I was like, hmm, this thing that I'm doing for an $8 billion Fortune 500 company isn't that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I should, I should go and like 
you know, start my own coaching business. And, uh, but there was a problem, which was that I wasn't doing anything to start the business. So, so yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm sitting, I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I know this passion of mine, blah, blah. And I really want to pursue it. And I think I'm capable. And I put it on my list. And at that point it was to write some articles. I was like, I need to start blogging. And, um, and it was on my list and then I didn't get it done that week. So I moved it to next week's list and then I didn't get it done that week. So I moved it to next week's list. And this went on for a number of weeks. And I really had to face the fact that like, I, at this level of inconsistent productivity, I'm not going to be able to achieve my true desires. Yep. And so in a fit of, in a fit of panic, I, I Googled how to be productive. Uh, and you know, all these things came up, right. And I'm, I'm going through it kind of like swiping, you know, like, like throwing papers on the floor, you know, digital papers, if you can just picture it like, Oh yep, Like tried that, read that, did that, didn't work. Uh, don't like that. Whatever. And, uh, and I was really disheartened after this like two hour binge on how to be productive. Like none of it really registered for me. And then I had this epiphany, uh, in kind of this moment of despair. And the epiphany was, yes, Aaron, you have tried all of these things, but there's two things that you haven't done. You haven't done them with an ADHD lens with your newfound knowledge about ADHD, and Mm -hmm. you've never done them all at exactly the same time. It's always done them like in, in, in series rather than in parallel. Uh, and that just, that opened everything up for me. Uh, so one of the things that I'm, you know, in the process of teaching people now is how to make productivity pain free, easy and automatic. And it really came down to this system that I developed to have me go from, you know, unable to take any action to, uh, I published 21 articles in 21 days. You know, when I started my YouTube channel, I'd filmed over 50 videos. I'd read over 75 books. Sure. I was taking on more responsibility at work. I was doing all this stuff while working full time uh, and actually doing better at my job. And it was just this wow. massive kind of night and day shift in terms of what I was able to achieve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really like the uh, that epiphany as far as looking at, gee, I haven't looked at these things from what I know about ADHD, and so how can I kind of apply that to all these different productivity strategies and do the strategies all at the same time? Instead of, well, I tried this, I tried this, I tried uh, getting better sleep, that didn't work. Yeah, because you know, <laughs> eating junk and not exercising, and then I tried exercising and I got injured because I was trying to do too much at once because that's <laughs> you jump in the middle and go everywhere at once. Um, and each of those little things didn't work instead of thinking, you know, I'll take a little step, I'll go for a 20 minute walk every day and I'll set some reminders so I go to bed and social distance from my phone, keep it six feet or more away from the side of the bed. And once we start doing some things together, then it gets easier. And gee, what can I add to it? So it's the little, <laughs> an accumulation of habits that oh, this is working pretty well now. And it's I think so well said. Me, it's it was hard to know how well that would work until I did it little by little and then found out, oh, I've made a lot of progress in this past year and I'm doing all these things that at first I thought, how can you do all that? And it's little by little, one step at a time. Yeah, and I think I think what you're saying is, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I just thought of a, a meme I had seen of two ladders and kind of reaching up into this the sky and one of them had very small steps and that person was about three quarters up the ladder 
The other one had such huge steps that that person couldn't even reach the first step. <laughs> Success is building on small steps. You know, I think it's, I think it's so important what you're saying there, and you know, the uh, that's I lost my train of thought a little bit, but um, you know, I would say I would say that uh, the thing that really kind of hit on for me, and I've seen with so many ADHDers, and you're, you know, this really goes to the point that you were making, is that the 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 lack of consistent productivity is in many ways at the core of so many of their challenges, right? Because mm -hmm. when we can't, when we, when we can't consistently be productive, if we don't feel that we're in control of our productivity and reliably can follow through it, well, we're not going to take on a bigger job role because we don't want to let ourselves down. We're not going to take on that business or that goal that we really want to pursue because we don't want to let our partner or our family down. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we have that like real dream of that thing, that passion, that, that hobby, whatever that we really want to pursue. But we also don't want to even let our dream down, right? Because we know if we start it and then we give up after a few weeks, it's going to be too painful. Yeah. And so we just kind of, and, but if we can shift that and we can get into that small steps that you're talking about, where it's just continually getting a little bit better, um, we can get out of the, uh, the inconsistency cycle, mm -hmm. right? Because what's the inconsistency cycle? Well, we try to take on too much, as you said, with the ladder, right? The step's too big. Then we get overwhelmed. Then we procrastinate. And then we go into self-shaming. And when we're self-shaming, we feel like crap, which then, you know, leads us to want to, it leads us into more overwhelm and, and to more procrastination. So we get into this really negative cycle, and, and along the way, there may be a detour in terms of, but if I play more video games, have another drink, smoke more weed, etc., go gambling and I feel good when I, if I get my dopamine hit another way, because we're impatient and we want that dopamine now, then I feel better. Yes, but then you aren't able to do even the basics, much less all the extra stuff you took on. So you're more overwhelmed, so you try to escape and put things off, and it's uh, the wrong cycle to get into. And that's where addictions of all kinds of things um, are more of a problem for people with ADHD, whether we know we have it or not. And, and, uh, Perhaps, yeah. And that's where I think, the, like you say, the... The coaching can help because someone else having that external accountability, not, well, I'm determined to do this, and we tell ourselves, here's a deadline, but that's really easy to blow off because, yeah, well, I'll get to it. Well, I was really busy this, this last week, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> having someone to help us, here's the small step, let me help you break that down, and then a week later, how are you doing on that? And there's no judgment. <laughs> we can't ask a spouse or a parent, um, maybe even a best friend, because they're quite likely to say, well, you just do it. What the heck's wrong with you? And right. Then it figures all that stuff from it, all the baggage that we carry. So, it, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, great for people with ADHD or may have it but they don't know it yet, to know the unproductive cycle and, the, and recognize this is a cycle, maybe it's over a year or more, and I'm taking medicine but I'm still in this cycle, okay, what's the next step? Um, so that this is, uh, I think, great, great material for uh, my listeners, and I've certainly uh, enjoyed our conversation, which at this point we should bring to a close, but I'm sure there'll be other times we can talk more. Uh, my guest has been Aaron Croft, a change management consultant. He had done that for 
many large companies, and now he's doing it one by one for those of us with ADHD, and also making it public on his website, hiddenadhd.com, as well as being on webinars and podcasts like this one. Aaron, it's been a wonderful pleasure to talk with you. Uh, the pleasure has been all mine. It's been an honor, a privilege, and I love the work that you're doing. And I just, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. And thanks to your listeners for taking time out of their busy days to improve themselves. Great. Thank you so much. This is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus, hoping that you've learned something today. And I look forward to helping you do it next time. Be well. Be well.